or tales of gold. He was rather too good for the average man. I mean, we couldn't live up to that degree of dedication and determination, which went on for so many years. His life was rowing, whereas for most of us, it was um, a recreation. The only thing I was, he was a tremendous stickler over was the national anthem and the Queen's speech at Christmas. Always very much of a gentleman. For instance, in one race here in the Diamond Skulls, he, he stopped because his opponent hit the skulls. And in fact, he lost the race because he had stopped, because he couldn't get his rhythm again. But he, he'd never, never win a race other than by fair means. You go to the regatta and get dressed up in frocks, the same, we used to get dressed the same. We used to come down to the regatta and it's Jack Beresford's daughters and all the rest of it. And um, it's only now that I think we've started to realise, especially in the last few years, and appreciate quite what it all meant. The statistics help us understand what it meant, and they are overwhelming. Jack Beresford competed in five Olympic Games in Antwerp, Paris, Amsterdam, Los Angeles and Berlin. He won a medal at each of them, three gold and two silver, and he was, quite simply, the finest oarsman that Britain has ever known. On Temple Island in the Thames, close by his beloved Henley, his family and his oldest friends gather to remember this extraordinary man. He was born in the last year of the 19th century, he died in 1977, and he is the yardstick by which British rowing continues to be measured. Jack was the son of Julius Beresford, who had won a silver medal in the Coxless Fours at the Stockholm Games of 1912. At Bedford School, he stroked the eight and captained the rugby 15. But his rugby ambitions met an early and abrupt conclusion, as his son John recalls. Unfortunately, the war, First World War that was, put pay to that when he was shot in the leg. And he was sent down to Foy in Cornwall to recuperate. And he used to row a, a pram dinghy all round the coast, apparently. <laughs> the most atrocious weather by the sound of it. Why he wasn't drowned, I don't know. And, um, and I think because he, he, his, rowing, his football or rugby football career was finished, he therefore turned to, to rowing. By 1920, as one of the most promising oarsmen in the country, he was selected for the single skulls at the Games of Antwerp. After a memorable duel with America's Jack Kelly, the father of the girl who became Princess Grace, Beresford was beaten by one second. But his silver medal represented the overture to an astonishing Olympic career. The first gold medal arrived four years later in Paris when he sculled to comfortable victory over America's William Garrett Gilmore. Came the Olympics of Amsterdam and Beresford embellished his collection with a silver medal in the eights. By now, his discipline and determination had acquired the status of legend. Roland George, who rode with Beresford in the British Coxless Fours crew in the 1932 Los Angeles Games, remembers the man. Everybody had tremendous respect for him. And I found him a very easy uh, person. I don't remember his being quarrelsome at all. He did have uh, people with whom he tended to be cool. But that was always put aside as far as the, the crew is concerned. He just had one ambition to, to win, and any personal antagonisms were just put aside for that. With that crew, Beresford won his second gold medal, and it seemed that his Olympic exploits were over. Yet the competitive hunger remained. At the age of 37, he was selected for the double skulls at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. 
and his fifth Olympiad was to prove the most memorable and dramatic of all. His partner was his protege, Dick Southwood. Their most formidable rivals were the German scholars, who were coached by the British professional, Eric Phelps. Phelps told the Britons that they were wasting their time as the Germans were so much faster. The rowing journalist, Chris Dodd, takes up the story. They didn't believe him. He challenged them to a race. He raced them, him in the single and them in the double, and beat them. And then Jack said to him, <coughs> OK, Eric, what have we got to do? And he said, first of all, you need a new boat, a lighter boat. And I think it was Roly Sims built them a boat in two and a half weeks. And uh, Eric started them on a training program which was much more similar to what the Germans had been doing. And he told them that the Germans were an 1,800 meter crew and that they would, they would break 200 meters before the line and that if they could get to the Olympic final and hang on to the Germans, they would beat them. Beresford and Southwood worked frantically, but their task was made no easier when their new boat went astray on arrival in Germany. It was found in a railway siding on the very eve of the Olympic regatta. Beresford carried his country's flag, but the British rower Tom Asquith recalls a disconcerting meeting. We were all drawn up, every country outside the stadium, before the opening ceremony, and hit the Rebutus. And he came as near as I am to you and stared each one in the face. It was a very sinister feeling one got. He, he, he had a very kind of keen personality, uh, and um, one could have believed anything. But at the same time, one couldn't help having a certain respect. He wasn't the little Charlie Chaplin that one had thought he was before. He was a potent character. The British pair were beaten by the Germans in the heats and reached the final through a repechage. But they learned from that early defeat. It seemed to them that the Germans jumped to the start. So in the, when they were alongside them in the final, um, it, Dick had noticed that the, the umpire, who was a Belgian guy called Victor de Bishop, had a huge megaphone. And when he, when he raised the megaphone to his mouth, it was impossible for him to see any of the crews alongside him. So just before the race, Dick said to Jack, he, he said, Jack, I'm going to go as soon as the Germans move. And uh, they did. And the Germans still beat them off the start. But it was, but there was a, a, vital, a vital split second uh, which helped them to win that race. Germany and Great Britain have left the others behind. They've covered about 1,500 meters, and Great Britain, lying behind but rowing well within themselves, are preparing to strike. Taking a look, getting ready, at 30. They're ahead. Germany look rowed out. Great Britain win by a length and a half. This was Beresford's fifth Olympic Games and his third gold medal. Germany second, Poland third. Beresford dreamed of competing in a sixth Olympics, but with the onset of war, he finally conceded that his rowing career was over. He is remembered with particular warmth at Henley, the regatta which he dominated during his career. His involvement continued throughout his life. A tragic accident on the Thames at Pangbourne when he was 70 years old had a traumatic effect upon Beresford. He attempted to rescue a young boy who had fallen into the river, but after an heroic struggle, his efforts failed. I think because you know, he was unable to save that boy's life, I'm afraid it did have a very, very deep effect 
And I think there was no question that he did lose the sight of the eye from then there on. And after that, perhaps his health did, you know, slowly start to deteriorate, really. Beresford died at his home by the Thames, the river on which he prepared to go out and defeat the world, time after time after time. One gets the impression that sport is becoming more and more the kind of dedication that Jack was following, but for a different reason, for money. Money didn't come into his aims and objects. It was a truly amateur ambition. Whether that still continues, I don't know. I'm not able to say, but I doubt it. Sharon and Tracy get a visit from the boys in blue next on BBC One in Birds of a Feather. <laughs>